As you can see now, you're on the DuPont stand here at the chemistry at work. Uh, my name is Seamus Hassan. Cameraman here is Arthur Logue, and the other gentleman's away from the chairs is Richard Best. What we want to talk about this morning is a little bit on polymer chemistry. A little bit on polymer chemistry. And let's move on here to this. And the way we want to approach this is by looking what is a polymer, how is a polymer made, and what influence does polymers have in our lives. Now, the first thing we have to look at is what is a polymer. Now, the simplest way to look at this is if we think in an analogy of a train, where you've one coach and you add on another and another and another and another, you end up with a big train or a chain where you take all the links and you add one link onto another and another and another and another, you can end up with a very long chain. And that effectively is what a polymer is. It's as, it's as simple as that. In reality, in making polymers, they're not as simple as that. But that's in fact what a polymer is anyhow. Now, up to the present, your chemistry has been pretty much inorganic. What I mean by that is you talked about things like sodium chloride, silver nitrate, copper sulfate going from blue to white when you stick it in the oven and putting an acid onto carbonates and getting off CO2. This is a new branch, this is organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is polymer chemistry, but organic chemistry is not, ex it's, it's not exclusive to polymers. It's, everything is organic beyond that. Life itself is made up of organic materials. Now, the organic material that you have here is, uh, the backbone of it is carbon in conjunction with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur and chlorine. Those are pretty much the elements you would use. From time to time you may have other ones, but not very many more than that. Now, there are a number of different polymers. Well, essentially, there are a number of different polymers, but there are two main types. There's the, the man-made ones that we'll talk about later on. They're the ones that the chemists make. But there's naturally occurring ones that have been there as long as we've been there. And if we look at those, if we take a simple example here, we see plants. All plant life are polymeric in nature, as indeed timber is. And the building block for this is glucose. Now, a glucose molecule there. If you were to bite into a twig, Looking for sugar, you'd be very disappointed because that's not in fact what it ends up in, in plants. That's the monomer unit, monomer meaning one, and that forms a polymer, which is, in this case is cellulose. And the way it links up is like this. One joins on to another, just like a train. Now, I have three up there. It's not just three. There could be thousands of them there, but, it's, but that, that, that's the type of linkage you would get in it. Now, another material where glucose plays a major part is in bread pasta, rice or potatoes. Now we know they're carbohydrates, but what other things would you say about them? They're all very what? They're all starchy materials. Now, the building block for making starch is glucose as well, and that's another, and that's, uh, uh, that's another polymer. You start out with glucose, and you have three molecules here linked the same way as you had cellulose, but you have another layer across the top, and in fact you have, you have a cross linkage here, and that gives you a new compound entirely, that's starch. That's a polymer as well. Now, another one where you get a, that's polymeric in nature is meat, as indeed is your hair, your hands, your nails. So effectively, everybody is a polymer. That's testimony that polymers have been around for a long time. And the building block here is another material or another compound called an amino acid. You won't recognize an amino acid, but when I, that's the monomer, but whenever I tell you what polymer you form from that, you will be able to see that forms a protein, and everybody's heard of proteins. So pr proteins are polymers as well. Now, there's a number of these proteins. It's, I've just illustrated that with one. Another material that's a naturally occurring polymer is natural rubber, got from plantations in the past, tapped out of the tree. And if we were to stay with that, we would not have motor cars as we know them today. 
because the rubber that you would have got then would not be suitable for tires and this sort of thing and parts of the cars that you would have today. Uh, the rubber from that could not withstand high temperatures. You couldn't have high fast performance cars and you couldn't have the parts for the engine that require rubber hosing and that. That would not last up to it. So that would have been no use at all. This is a very simplification of making polymers. This is essentially what happens in the polymer industry today. You start off with a monomer, which is a single unit, and you go through this process. If you look here, you see all sorts of pipes and towers and tanks, and you see steam coming out of buildings and this sort of thing. That effectively is a, polymer, a polymerization process. And the end product there is a polymer. So you start off with the monomer, you process the monomer, and you end up with your polymer. Again, it's a very simplified version of what happened. The first man to discover polymers, to make a polymer, was a Swiss chemist called Oudmeyers. And he did this in 1855. And what he discovered was he could make synthetic silk by spinning out cellulose nitrate into a fibre. Now, at that time, that must have been an absolute revolution because does anybody know where you would have got silk at that time? Silkworms. Now, would well, there been plentiful supplies of it? It would have been subject to environmental conditions where you could have these worms, climatic changes and things like that. It wouldn't have been a certain supply. You couldn't have relied on the supply. And of course, with a limited supply, what would that have done to the price? Very, very, very expensive and would not have been available to everyone. Now, this material, this synthetic silk that he came out with is now known as viscose. And that, in fact, is used for lining blazers today. That was his first venture into it. Now, DuPont are around for 200 years, as you can see from our display here. Their first venture was not into polymers. They were very late in coming into polymers. 200 years ago in the States, there was a good market for explosives because America was de developing. They were making new roads, they were making railways, they were blasting tunnels, and there were loads of wars on. So it was a very lucrative business to be in, but obviously DuPont had the foresight to see that if you were limiting your businesses to one or two products, you would go out of business. And they did realize that the new mer emerging science at that time was polymer chemistry. And in fact, they recruited people to work on this. The principal one being a chemist called Carruthers. And if you go on and do polymer chemistry, it'll be a household name with you. He was responsible for developing nylon. He was also responsible for de developing polyester and neoprene. Three major, major achievements of the day. Now, whenever he came out with the nylon, the war was on, it was the, the late 30s. And of course, nylon was used for parachutes. It was great to have for parachutes. And nobody could get any nylon. Nylon so stockings were very much sought after at that time. No way, you couldn't have had them. It was only after the war was over they could be got. This is in the days prior to tights, of course. Things have changed and moved on. That was one of the things he came up with was nylon. And the, another one was polyester. Now, polyester has a number of uses. In your shirt, there's a high probability it's a mixture of polyester and cotton. Because polyester mixed with cotton gives a, gives a property that it doesn't need ironing or needs very minimal ironing, if at all. Uh, in this particular application here, it's used for making bottles. Now, what properties would make this ideal versus glass? What advantages would we have here? Pardon? It's not brittle, it won't break, so that's a big safety factor. What other things would it have? That's much lighter, yes. And of course, before you could use that for that, it must be easily what? Mold it. It has to be easily molded. A lot of the times things can come out, but they can't, they can't be transferred into the right form to make them practical. So every polymer developed is not a winner. Some of them have no application, but in this case it has. Can anybody tell me another end use for polyester? Where would you have it in the old tapes? 
and the old cassette tapes. Cassettes, the audio cassettes you would have had polyester in those. Now, another very, very old polymer, and long before DuPont got into it, was Bakelite. This was a very brittle polymer that was used for light switches in the early days when electricity would have been installed in houses. Not a particularly good one, but the best that there was of the day, and has long since gone. Another very important polymer is polystyrene. And note when we talk about polymers, it's poly this, poly that, poly the other. Poly is the word that comes before it, and this is polystyrene. What is the big plus for that for burgers? A good, it's a good insulator. Any other thing that makes it very important? Yes, it's waterproof, that's correct, that's a good one. Another one? It's more hygienic than wrapping up in uh, newspapers. It's much, much more hygienic. Now, where would you find that in the house? Not in, not in that shape, because that had to be moulded. Pardon? Right, it's used for cavity wall insulation and roof space insulation. Now, isn't that a major advantage in having a polymer like that? It means you can heat your houses cheaper and make them much, much more comfortable. Now, you see how that was moulded? That, in fact, is polystyrene as well. That's moulded and processed differently. But at the, the base molecule there is still polystyrene. That's another application of it there, if you'd hold that on up, Richard. And Tyvek, which is a polyolefin. This here is a waterproof polymer used for making envelopes and for packaging. It can be torn, but with great difficulty. Very suitable for sending documents that are valuable in the post. And this would take us on to Maydown, away up in the northwest. Now, you have at the moment, we make Lycra and we make Kevlar. Now, has anybody heard, or rather, it's easier to say, has anybody not heard of Lycra? Thanks, Richard. Lycra is a stretchy, it's an elastane fiber. There's two different molecules, two different monomers in there to make that polymer. Now, what's the important characteristic about this? It has to stretch, and more important still, that it has to contract back to its original length. That's a very important thing, and that's what gives it the comfort fit. Now, it's that stre will stretch to five times its length for one polymer, and with another polymer that goes to seven. Now that's another important thing when you're developing polymers. Even though you develop something that's good, there's always opportunities to improve on it, and you make a better polymer than you had originally. And a few applications we have in that is it's used in shoes, it's used in suiting, it's used mixed with linen as well, and it's used in the old nappies. Now, the reason it's used in the nappies is not because it's cheaper, believe it or not in this case, but it gives a more comfortable fit. If you had nitrile rubber and nappies, it will give red marks around the legs and around the waistbands of the babies. This here makes it much, much more comfortable. Uh, used in stocking tops, it's used in the uh, men's underpants as well, waistbands, and it's used in tights. Now, whenever tights came in around the early 90s, that caused sort of a real boom as far as lycra was concerned, because stockings up to that would not have had the same amount of lycra, but once tights came in, it took, the business took off. And another fibre that we make as well at the moment is Kevlar. Has anybody heard of Kevlar before? Right. I think this appeals more to the boys, the Kevlar one. This is not made for stretch. This is for strength. That there has five times the strength of steel on a weight for weight basis, if you pass that around. Now, there's quite a lot of applications for this as well. You get it in brake linings and cars. You also get it in seals for yachts because on the old canvas seals, they will tear rather easily. Kevlar seals will not, will not tear. It's also used in fishing rods. It's used for reinforcing concrete. Now, if you're reinforcing concrete, it's obviously very strong. If you were to wear a glove made of that, you would not cut yourself with a razor blade. You could run your blade across there and wouldn't cut, won't cut through. And of course, it's used in all sorts of cables. And of course, one of the favorite uses and very 
useful at the moment out in Iraq, used by the coalition forces will be one of these. Major outlet for it, bulletproof vests. And they do save lives because we have countless testimonies from the police in New York to say it has saved a lot of lives. And another one we have here, we don't make it sadly now anymore from Maydown because a lot of these products, the life cycle goes and you have to come up with new products all the time. But neoprene is still to the fore. Neoprene is synthetic rubber. If you, that were used in gloves, you could handle assets with that. You couldn't handle it with ordinary gloves. It's used to withstand very high temperatures and very cold temperatures for laying cables, so it's used for laying cables. It would also be used in car parts and the tires because inside the engine of the car, a lot of the parts get very, very hot. Unless you, if you were using the old natural rubber, it wouldn't withstand the temperatures. And the tires wouldn't withstand either unless you had them from neoprene because of the high temperatures that you would, uh, the, high, the, the heat you would generate traveling at high speeds. And of course, another way that you can handle a rubber to make it more, make it stronger is by vulcanizing it. If we can get this, if Houdini can get his chain up here. In fact, if you take a, if you take a, a tire out of, your, uh, out of a bicycle, you can pull it apart, it's very easy to pull. If you were to cut a piece out of a, uh, out of a car tire, you would not be able to do that because it has been vulcanized. And what this means is, if you have one layer of molecules and there's nothing to keep them apart, you can pull one over the other. But in fact, if you cross-link them like this, you make it very, if I take one from the bottom layer and try to pull it, I can't do it because they're jo the two chains are joined together. And in fact, that is went by vulcanization. It gives it strength. And another product that we would have made in the past is Hypalon, which is another rubber material. Again, this would have been used for bridges and lining ponds, pond liners and things like that. That's all I have on it. If there's anybody who has any questions, I want to ask about any of the polymers we've talked about or about DuPont, I'll try and answer them. Thanks very much for your attention, boys.